Hi, I'm Bill Arnold. Thank you for listening to this podcast. There are many more podcasts available at MyFaithRadio.com. Your support makes this possible. Thank you. Afternoon show. I'm Bill Arnold. Thank you for tuning in today. I hope you've had a great day. All right. We got a great show. David Wheaton is going to join me. We're going to continue our series on embracing a Christian worldview. It's going to be a whole year long. It's a 12 part series. We get him once a month. So I'm looking forward to catching up again. David is the host of a, the Christian worldview. You can learn more about that at thechristianworldview.org. Hello, David. Good afternoon, Bill. Beautiful day. I hope you uh, got out in the sun a little bit. Maybe, uh, did you get on the tennis court today? I did not, but I have been outside uh, mowing the lawn. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't seem like something you should be doing. But anyway, I'm glad you're back. I'm looking forward to continuing our study on embracing a Christian worldview. Uh, maybe we should just talk about what we uh, mentioned last time, because that was about a month ago. Yeah, well, today is part five. And part four was actually an important one because we went over the fundamental framework of a Christian worldview. Uh, There's there's, there's four parts to it. And how the the first fundamental of creation, that God created a perfect world, um, is, is found there right in the opening chapter of Genesis. And there's so many things, as we went over last time, that were established early on by God that are still uh, employed today, but are so rejected today, you know, from a standpoint of right away in Genesis 1, a pre-existing, all-knowing, all-powerful God exists and speaks the world into existence in mm-hmm. six literal days. You know, that that's a, a huge thing. Think about evolution today, completely rejects that, that assertion in Genesis chapter 1, that God created two humans in two genders, male and female, mm-hmm. uh, uniquely in his own life. Think about that issue. I mean, even this month, uh, that that is something that is completely rejected, that you can choose your own gender. Uh, that that's not a scientific possibility, but that's what we're told today. Um, God told uh, Adam and Eve to rule over creation, uh, to multiply, to procreate, to have stewardship over the earth. Not worship of the earth, but stewardship over it. Uh, and then in chapter 2, Bill, uh, God gave Adam work to do. This is before the fall. Like work was a good thing, not something to avoid, but a good thing, to be productive. God gave him free will to make decisions. He gave him a test of faith. You can eat all the, the trees in the garden except for this one. It wasn't overly restricted, but still there was a test of obedience. And then God, in Genesis chapter 2, establishes marriage as to be between one man and one woman. Now, if you look at just the handful of things I've mentioned that are established in the first two chapters of Genesis with this first fundamental that God created a perfect world, it is notable how the worldview of our day rejects basically every single aspect of this this first fundamental. God doesn't exist. Man evolved. You can change your gender. Marriage is whatever arrangement Mm -hmm. you want it to be. Work is oppressive. And we need to save or worship Mother Earth rather than be stewards of it. And so... It, you can see how this first fundamental of a Christian worldview was easily led into the second fundamental, which we just uh, last time, because uh, man failed this test of obedience. And so the second fundamental of corruption came around. This changed everything. You know, Eve is, te- is tempted by Satan. She gives him the temptation. She eats. She gives the fruit to her husband. He eats. Uh, it would be hard to overstate just how significant of a moment that was, Bill, corrupted everything of God's perfect design. And we see this today, the the amount of sin and violence and conflict and injustice and ultimately death that just marks our world. It makes perfect sense with what reality that we all face today, this second fundamental. And it puts us at odds with God. It alienates us from Him. And so this is the reason why the world is the way it is. There's some good things in the world for sure, Mm -hmm. um, but we all see, if we have our eyes open, just how much sin uh, operates in our world. And then finally, we got to the third fundamental last week, which is the fundamental of redemption. It's the good news that even in the midst of all this corruption, God is mercifully and graciously redeeming some 
out of this corruption through the person and work of his son, Jesus Christ. And he promised this, by the way, way back in Genesis, after, after they sinned, he said, I will put enmity between you and the woman. He's speaking to Satan here. And between your seed and her seed, he, Christ, shall bruise you on the head. There'll be a fatal blow. And you, Satan, shall bruise him on the heel. The crucifixion was seen as a, a bruise on his heel, but not fatal, and that Christ would win. This is the, the first picture of a Redeemer coming. And then just soon after, in the same chapter, God makes garments of skin for Adam and his wife. This is the first example of someone having to die to make atonement. There had to be blood shed to cover sin. And he clothed Adam and Eve with the skin of an animal. And this pre- prefigures what Christ is going to do and shed his own blood so we can be covered in his righteousness. So I know that was a long answer, but last session was extremely important to understand the creation, corruption, and redemption before we get to the fourth fundamental today. Yeah, well, David, the corruption part that we witness every day in the news and in our world, uh, thank goodness we have the redemption and the good news of Jesus Christ, because without that, uh, we would not have good news. We would not. No. We operate. I was going to say we operate in the midst of these 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 second and third fundamentals today. That we're just sort of living in this world of corruption. We see it all around us. Uh, you know, we can we can put rose colored glasses on, but that still doesn't uh, blind us from the sin that's all around us. And by the way, inside of us as well. If we're honest with ourselves, we see that you know we have selfish and uh, desires and things we do that aren't honoring to God. So there's corruption all around us and inside of us. And at the same time, the third fundamental is an operation, too. We see great acts of God's redemption, how God saves sinners, how he saved me uh, from being in my sin and going my own way and living in opposition to God. And this explains the world around us today. We have this mix of terrible, sinful corruption, but yet the good news of redemption that, that takes place. And this has been the story not only today, but from the time of Adam and Eve's sin. You look through the Old Testament uh, you had the nation of Israel. You had the foreshadowing of the sacrificial system that this eventual Redeemer would come. Then the Redeemer comes in the New Testament, born of a, vi- a virgin so as to be without sin, lives a sinless life so he could be the perfect sinless substitutionary sacrifice for our sin on the cross. He rises from the grave, ascends to heaven, victorious over sin and death, and he promises to return someday. And unfortunately, those who reject this call this what the Bible says foolishness. Mm-hmm. I think it's a nice, maybe a moral story. Uh, they think that uh, God sending his son to die is cosmic child abuse. And so they have um, uh, man solutions to the, the problems that are going on. We need better education. We need better environment. We need to spend more money. We need to change your community, leave the world a better place. None of those things are kind of bad in and of themselves, but not one of those things redeems anyone from their sin. Only Jesus Christ can do that. And that's why the book of Acts says there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus is the only way to be redeemed. Mm -hmm. David, your biblical foundations are solid. Let's move on to the fourth fundamental and God's promise for the future. Right. So we've gone from creation, that God created perfection, establishing his will and ways right at the very mm-hmm. beginning of the Bible, to corruption, that man rebels, wreaks corruption on the world, death and alienation from God. Good news of redemption is number three. God graciously provides one way of redemption through his son, Jesus Christ. And then you get to the fourth one you're asking about, and the fourth one is restoration. This is the, the, the promise of hope and justice, that God will reward the righteous someday. He will punish those who have rebelled against him. None of us get away with our sin. Either we pay the penalty for our own sin or God will have Jesus pay the penalty for us if we receive, um, uh, if we believe in his His act on our behalf uh, by faith. And then also he will create a new heavens and a new earth. And so if you just contrast that, Bill, with the humanistic worldview, that the future is all about moving. We can make a utopian world. We can make a better world where everyone lives in peace and harmony. We can have a, if we can just get back to a global community as they had in the city of Babel, Mm -hmm. then the world would be a better place. And everyone's familiar with the song by John Lennon, Imagine. 
And I just would like to read a couple of the, the stanzas because it, it, it gives the, the worldview of our day about what the future is about. He says, imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us, above us only sky. Imagine all the people living for today. Imagine there's no countries. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for and no religion, too. Imagine all the people living life in peace. Imagine all the people sharing all the world. Imagine no possessions. I wonder if you can. No need for greed or hunger, a brotherhood or of man. You may say that I'm a dreamer, and I won't say, Bill, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will be as one. Wow. And, you know, if you just, you know, just think about the lyrics, about the music in the background, without the jingle for a second. Um, this is what unredeemed man has for the hope of the future. But God has a very, very different plan that will be enacted. Again, this is imagine. This is imagination for John Lennon. It's not going to happen because God in Revelation 21, which we can talk about after the break, tells us exactly what's going to happen in the future. Mm -hmm. David Wheaton is my guest. We're continuing our study on embracing a Christian worldview. It's a 12-part series. We're in number five. We'll take a break and be right back. Hi, this is Bill Arnold. You might be the kind of person that goes to Paris and still listens to Faith Radio on the app. Or you might be more like the person that goes into the next room in your apartment and listens. The good news is, is using the app is just as easy in both places. Downloading the free app is crazy easy. Just text the word app to 877-933-2484 and click the link. And if you happen to be in Paris, there is a really nice little coffee shop not far from the Eiffel Tower that serves a really nice chocolate biscotti. Welcome back to the show. David Wheaton is my guest. We're continuing our study on embracing a Christian worldview. We are in part five. And David, uh, we're going to get to restoration today. I'm, I'm going to love talking about that. God will reward the righteous, punish the rebels, and create a new heavens and a new earth. Yeah, and so I just want to contrast what John Lennon wrote in the song, Imagine, yeah. about man's vision for the future and everything he said there with what actually the inspired and errant, all-sufficient, authoritative, immutable Word of God says. In Revelation chapter 21, the Apostle John was inspired to write, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the, and the first earth passed away, and there's no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne, God's throne, saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be among them. It's an incredible image here of, like, you know, we're going to live in this, this new heavens and new earth. It's going to be a physical existence, by the way. We're not going to be playing, Christians aren't going to be playing harps on, on clouds somewhere. Um, this is going to be a, a recreated, rest, restore new heavens, in New Earth, and it says in verse 4, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will no longer be any death. I can't you wait for that day. Mm -hmm. There will be no longer any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. So just describing this new heavens and new earth where believers in Christ who have believed in him are going to spend eternity in the presence of God. It's just an unimaginable bliss. But then it also says that he who overcomes will inherit these things. He who overcomes us, the one who, who is repentant and believed in the gospel, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But then there's a warning here in verse 8, Bill. He says, but for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars. Now, these are, we are all of those things, but some of us have repented and entrusted in Christ's work on our behalf to be forgiven of those things. Others 
have not repented of those things. And the warning here is their part, it says in Revelation 21, will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So while this this restoration fundamental, this fourth one, is the promise of hope for believers, it's also a promise of judgment for those who reject God's gift, God's offer to to reconcile us to him through his son, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And so Christ is going to return to rain, Bill. Every knee is going to bow either willingly or unwillingly. He's going to destroy the present earth and heavens with fire, and he's going to restore all things. There will be perfect justice someday meted out by the the perfect God. And so this is something as a believer that I'm very, very much looking forward to. I'm happy to hear that every day, David. If you... If I heard that every day, I would be happier. I need to tell myself that truth every day. Yeah, I, I think you're right, Bill, because yeah. that, that's why these fundamentals of a biblical worldview are so important to know, because they, they help explain what's going on in our world and, and gives us a perspective outside just the, the day-to-day uh, life we live, the disappointments, the, the shock we receive by things going on in the news. It gives us kind of the, the meta narrative, meta narrative of what's going on. Mm-hmm. May, David, maybe we can talk more about these four fundamentals, and you know, maybe we can explain the complexities and the big questions of life. I mean, it, it's very easy to to live in this world and be very unstable. Uh, you're trying to figure out, you know, the big. You know, I, I think unfortunately most people do not think about the the big questions of life. Where did I come from? Why am I here? Uh, where am I going after I die? Th- those are really important questions to think about, uh, not just kind of the temporal, mundane things of life. You know, we're ha- where we're having our next meal or what we're going to watch on TV tonight or our kids' sporting event. I mean, think about the big questions. The Bible gives answers to these questions. These four fundamentals give answers to these. Like the first one, God created the world uh, for and us ultimately to bring him glory, to, to know him and to bring him glory. There's the purpose of life right mm, there. If right. you want Amen. the purpose of life, that's it. You know, number two, uh, on the corruption one, we rebelled against him. That's corrupted everything. That explains, if you want to know why there's so many, why, why you have to put locks on your doors, that, that's the reason, because the, the sinfulness of mankind. If you, if you want to know why people and our loved ones die, it's sin. It's not necessarily like they're punished for some particular sin. It's the, it's the corruption of sin that we have all brought into the world that brings forth death. The wages of sin is death. But if you want to know the solution to all of it, you look to the third fundamental, the, the fundamental of redemption, that God is graciously and mercifully redeeming sinners out of this corruption who come to him in penitent faith, and then finally, the fourth one ex- explains, like, what's the future? What, what's what's going to happen in the future? Well, there's going to be true justice in the future, perfect justice, not injustice like we see today, but perfect justice, and it brings us hope as well. So it, it just explains some of those really big complexities and big questions of life that, that God doesn't leave us just kind of wondering, what is life all about? Mm-hmm. David, and this is so important that as believers, we have a framework, we have boundaries that we can take life's complexities and problems and process them through these, it really gives us um, uh, great tools to understand our faith and how to how to put it into uh, application every day. It, it certainly does. Mm-hmm. It really does. You know, without a Christian worldview, you just think, how do you process the world? You're just kind of taking bits and pieces of things you you learned in school or maybe how you were raised or some book you read or an influential movie you saw and you're you're just having this buffet of a worldview that, that's, you know, it's illogical and it's contradictory and it's based on feelings, not based on reality. And you're just trying to kind of muddle through life. And the biblical worldview is great because it's true. It represents reality. And so God gives us this thing so we can be stable in the midst of an unstable world. Mm-hmm. David, what other great truth do these fundamentals uh, explain? Well, I think listeners could probably figure that out as you go from creation and our purpose, you know, we're, we're created for God's glory. And then you go to the second part. The problem is that we're sinners. You get to the third one. What's the solution? It's, it's the person and work of Christ. It really explains what the gospel is. It not only explains these four fundamentals, not only explain, you know, life as we live it, 
but it also explains what the good news is um, that answers the bad news. You know, I grew up in a Christian home, Bill, I think, as you well know, but it wasn't until my early 20s in wrestling with an unrelenting conflict inside of me over my sin that I first began to read the Bible and understand these four fundamentals that God had created me, not primarily just to be successful in my career, but to be in relationship with him, to know him and to obey him, to live for his glory. But I was practicing sin, the second fundamental. I was corrupting my own life and others' lives, and I deserved God's judgment. And yet the third fundamental, God offers redemption through what Christ did for me on the cross. And number four, by receiving that by faith, who Christ is and what he did for me, I would have the promise of forgiveness of sin, of eternal life, of restoration someday. And so my life in eternity changed when I was 24 years old, when I repented and placed my faith in Christ. And anyone listening to me today, it, that offer is open to them as well as for me. It's, it's for you listening today. Mm-hmm. So I would just encourage people to, to think about God's offer of the gospel and, and respond to it by repenting of sin and putting faith in who Christ is and what he did for you on the cross. Yeah, David, how would someone start that relationship? If they're listening to today and they're in the car and they're thinking, I've heard this message more than once, and it's starting to make sense to me today, how would I start yeah. that relationship? Well, it's, it, it's, it's actually very simple, yet eternally profound. It's, it's, it's seeing yourself as God sees you, that you're, you've sinned against the king of this universe. And the king of this universe is a just God, and he justly punishes our sin. We are alienated from him. But then it's, it's just simply receiving by faith, not, not faith plus some of our own good deeds, but trusting in what Jesus Christ did for us, that he lived a perfect life, the life we should have lived. He died on the cross as the actual payment for our sin. He satisfied God's wrath and justice over our sin. He rose victoriously from the grave uh, to, be, to be our Savior. And it's putting our, our faith in his work and not our own work that God accepts as receiving the gift he offers us. And that's when he says we can be, he, he regenerates us. He makes us born again. And uh, he spiritually enlivens us. He gives us his Holy Spirit so that we can live, not only be born again, but we can live lives that honor him. Mm-hmm. And that perfect substitute, that perfect sacrifice on the cross, I had a guest uh, about a month ago, David, uh, reminding me that it was a Trinitarian decision that Jesus would go to the cross. It's a beautiful thought. Very much. Very much. It yeah. really was. Yeah. Well, this is a great study, and I am so glad that we're taking this on because I think after this study is completed, listeners, if they hear all of it, and they can probably, we'll organize it on the website, and you can uh, check it all out at once once we get it organized, you will be able to go through this study and feel very confident that you can process life's complexities and problems through this beautiful Christian worldview, which I think it's important we all understand. David, you're doing a beautiful job of walking us through this. Thank you very much. Yeah. You're welcome, Bill. I really appreciate being with you. Yeah. And uh, I hope you finish cutting the lawn. If not, get out there and finish. Will do. (laughs) Thanks. David Wheaton has been my guest. You can learn more about him at thechristianworldview.org, thechristianworldview.org. I highly recommend you head over there. You can hear his uh, podcast. They're there. And he's also live on Saturday morning. Take a break. When we come back, Scott Hubbard from Desiring God is going to talk about good leaders fail well. How mistakes become a staircase. like me, I bet you've made a mistake now and then in the past. Maybe it's been a while since you've made a mistake, but you know what? God uses mistakes to shape us, to turn us into something um, more resilient, and God uses those opportunities, and I think making mistakes is pretty important, because I've made a lot in my 
in my life, and I, I've usually learned something pretty significant through all of them. And I'm here today to talk to Scott Hubbard. He's an editor at DesiringGod.org, and he's written an article that you can find over at DesiringGod.org called Good Leaders Fail Well, How Mistakes Become a Staircase. Scott, welcome back. It's good to be with you, Bill. Yeah. So, all right. If you, you've made mistakes in life, right? <laughs> yeah, this was a very personal article. Okay. So we're both on common ground. Rosie's yep. never made one, but no. but, but we're, uh, <laughs> you know, two out of three in this room is not bad. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Those are yeah. the odds. And it sounds like nothing has been too large scale or too shocking in your in your world, but uh, enough mistakes, stumbles, uh, sometimes you say sometimes sinful, sometimes not. Yeah, that's right. That was the most surprising part about leadership for me. I anticipated on the front end, and when I say leadership, I mean all, all different kinds. For me, in particular, it's been in, in the realm of ministry of various sorts, leading a small group and then eventually being a lay pastor. But one of the surprising things I, I expected, you know, this will bring hard, hard decisions, this will bring relational difficulties, you know, just conflict, resolution, that kind of stuff. I didn't expect how much failure it would bring wow. or how much failure I would have to wade through. And like you said, the main things that I have in mind when I say failure aren't the large scale stuff that would get you, you know, removed from a ministry position mm-hmm. or something like that. Those happen. But the thing I have in mind are the more small, small scale stuff, like little things that sting and just you really wish you had done that or said that differently. Yeah. Stuff that makes you look backward and just feel a little embarrassed. Well, can you give me some examples? Yeah, I include a a list here of the kind of things I have in mind that are very common uh, in my own life. So whether it's public speaking stuff, you give a sermon and it just comes out flat and doesn't seem to do much of anything. That's tough, by the way. Yeah, that's painful. That's hard. Yeah. Yeah. Or leading a Bible study that just kind of seems to go, go nowhere or saying things publicly that you regret telling a joke that you realize afterward, oh, that was unwise, or yep. or rendering a judgment too quickly or something like that. Mm-hmm. Trying something new, a new initiative in ministry or, you know, in your family maybe that just falls on its face. Having the experience of someone younger, maybe you were discipling them and they end up finding more help elsewhere. Mm-hmm. All, all those kinds of things. Yeah. Uh, old pastor of mine said, if everything you do works... You're not being creative enough. Uh, amen to that. Yeah, that that's true? right. Yeah, but you what, do need to make mistakes. You totally do. And yeah. in fact, one of the pieces, a, a friend of mine, as I was thinking about these things, he just said that, yeah, there there are people, some people who need to be making a lot more mistakes yeah. because the lack of mistakes in their life shows they're actually not trying very many they're things. They're playing too safe. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So let's talk about uh, some of the leaders, though, who have failed in significant ways and that certainly hurts the the body. Yes, it does, and that's the kind of failure that's of a of a different scale. It can certainly still fall into the categories that we're going to talk about today mm-hmm. of something that just wonderfully and miraculously God still works together for the good of His people and for our good. But um, those are the kind of things we want to avoid at all costs mm-hmm. and be so vigilant against. You know, the church. The church needs fail, needs needs leaders who know how to fail well. Yeah, they the church does not need leaders who fail out of ministry because of some you know scandal or something like yeah. that. Yeah, well, uh, Scott Hubbard is my guest. Scott, maybe just as we get this discussion going on on leadership failures, maybe we can look into the Old Testament and pick out a couple favorites. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's kind of all over if you yeah, it consider it. But some of the people that I had in mind were Moses and David. And then in the New Testament, Peter is the one that would probably come to mind most readily, but really all the disciples. But you think of Moses and and of David. These are men who were familiar with failure. And no doubt on one level, they would have known failure well before they were in leadership positions. Moses, while he was in Midian, just raising a family. David, while he was tending his father's flocks. Because, I mean, you can't get away from failure in this Mm -hmm. world. But once those men became leaders, they knew failure in a different kind of way. Mm -hmm. It was now the kinds of mistakes they were making before in a private realm were now in 
public. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and not only that, but, you know, if you go from simply raising a family to uh, leading a nation or being a shepherd to being a shepherd of a whole people, just all of a sudden your chances for failure are multiplied. Because you're trying stuff that you weren't trying before, the stakes are raised. Same thing with Peter and the disciples. They're brought into an unfamiliar world in some ways by leadership. And so mistakes are going to multiply. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about some of the paths. There's, you say there's two common paths. Let's talk about those, Scott Hubbard. At least in my own experience, and as I think about just the human heart and what we see in Scripture, it seems like for leaders who fail, there are two common paths, not the only paths, but two common ones in to respond in ways that are not how God would have us respond. The first of them is to wrap yourself around with a kind of cast iron cloak. So now you don't feel mistakes anymore. They just kind of ricochet off of you and you refuse to let your failures really touch your skin and feel them and sit mm-hmm. with them because it's just so uncomfortable. So you become this just kind of removed, distant kind of leader And the person that comes to mind from scripture in that regard is King Saul. And he just shows the danger of going down that path. He he became impervious to feeling the failures at their full weight. And so he just gradually grew harder and harder until he was at a spot way different from where he was at the beginning of his kingship. So that's one. Probably the more common path, the one that I'm more prone to, Mm -hmm. is to run away in (laughs) in various ways. To feel like crawling under the carpet and the practical expressions of that being, you know, you just, you just don't want to do it again. You don't want to lead again. You don't, you don't want to try that again. You don't want to feel the sting of that failure again. Yeah. And so if you don't remove yourself from mm-hmm. leadership, at least you just stop trying so hard. You, you have to protect your brain from going black and white because it can go black and white really fast. Well, what do you mean by that? Like, Oh, I'm never doing that again. Yeah, That's it. Yeah. I'm not stepping my foot into that pool again yeah <laughs> yeah i'm done that's right the the that's always and, and the white. nevers yeah, yeah yeah in that moment yeah so um temptation to protect ourselves fair it's fair with all of us yeah it is it is all of us and yet as you think about biblical story as you think about your own local church uh if every leader who was stung by failure stepped away from leadership even as you think about your family, if every leader stung by failure stepped away, there would just be no leaders. <laughs> because That's so true. Failure is just inherent in the task. Yeah. You can't lead well without also failing. And so there's got to be a way where uh, God would do something productive with our failures so we could walk through it better. Scott, do you think we're being more scrutinized than ever before in this day and age when it comes to failures? I mean... If yeah. you have a mistake, it's going to be broadcast everywhere. Yeah, yeah, that's true. It's the, gonna... the possibilities of becoming exposed for your failures are higher than they were before. No doubt that's true with all the technologies that we have. Yeah. So, yeah, that's uh, a good point. All right, let's uh, talk about what failures m- mean. I mean, you say in your article at DesiringGod.org, every failure, a stare. Yeah. Talk about that. This was an image that just proved very helpful for me in the aftermath of the kinds of failures that we've been talking about, which is in the aftermath of failure, what can happen by grace is that the failure itself becomes a stair and our failures become a staircase that the Lord himself makes uh, such that failures aren't, aren't, on, aren't merely this um, just kind of bad experience to grit your teeth and get through, but they can actually become part of what makes you as a leader. So I just talk in the article about how we need this category, not only for how leaders make mistakes, but for how mistakes can make leaders, Mm. how it can actually form you be an integral part of the process for you becoming the leader that God made you to be. So Scott, if you can personalize that when you've had a mistake, um, how has God shaped you in a more productive way? Well, I, have this this kind of three part three step framework that has been helpful for me to try to shepherd my own heart through especially based on the story that we see in scripture of Peter's failure and his restoration but the three things are own your failures learn from your failures and then keep leading after your failures mm, that's good stuff 
I want to take this one step at a time. Yeah. Let's, let's start with owning your failure. We do go back to the story of Peter. Yeah. And he swore he would die before he denied Jesus. How did that work out? <laughs> no, no. Well, I, that's what I recall. It did not, it did not go <laughs> yeah, well. Good job. You remembered that, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But in, instead of fleeing, because you say that is a pretty common response, is just to flee. Um, he owned it. He did. He could have fleed. And the first mark of him owning it was that he wept like a baby. Mm, yeah. A bitter weeping. He knows the truth then, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, he sees himself for who he is in, a, in the deepest way than he has ever seen himself. And he feels it so deeply. He doesn't run. And one of the remarkable things, it's just a minor note in the story, but you, the next, you know, the next time you see Peter, where is he? He's with the other disciples. Mm-hmm. He didn't have to do that. He could have run away. Yeah. How embarrassing to go back to those men and to be known as the man who did that, to yeah, have to no tell kidding. them, to have to tell the ones who didn't hear about it yet. Yeah, that, I, I did that. How embarrassing. Yeah. And yet he did it because there's this posture that he has of totally owning it. And then the last picture you see is with him and Jesus on the shore of Galilee, John 21, where he offers no justification, no excuse, no rationalization, but just owns it there before his Lord. Do you think any of the the other disciples were maybe not talking to him though <laughs> <laughs> yeah i wouldn't be surprised i mean he was there with them but you know yeah. we don't know how friendly they're like they we were. ran away but we didn't do that <laughs> <laughs> yeah right yeah so he's he's standing um before the lord in that uh, john 21 and owning his failure uh that's that's significant um yeah so you say in your article sometimes of course our failures are matters more of weakness than of sin yeah. Can you say more about that? Yeah, I think that's an important category to keep open. The kinds of failures we've been talking about kind of go go over both sides of that divide. Some of them are sinful. You know, you you tell you say a joke or you utter a judgment publicly you shouldn't have said. It's a you know hastiness of speech. Those are things you need to ask forgiveness for most right. likely. But then a lot of the stuff we've been talking about runs into the category of weakness of uh, immaturity, maybe stuff you don't need forgiveness for, but that you're still responsible for. You know, whether by your own inexperience, you just made a mistake. And I I think in those moments, the same categories still apply. Often God is revealing something to us in those moments about ourselves that we really need to see. And sometimes deeply, we need to see it. And if we don't see it, if we refuse to see it, if we refuse to own it, then it's going to shortcut this process that we're talking about. Mm-hmm. Scott, I'd love for you to spend a little more time talking about the difference between sin and immaturity. Yeah, I would say, let me just... I mean, I know sin. To give an example. I I don't have any problem with that. Maybe it's the immaturity part. An example of immaturity would be, you know, let's say you start some kind of ministry initiative. You start a certain outreach to a particular group of people or a certain kind of small group. And for various reasons, it was unwise. Like it wasn't the right time. Oh, gotcha. It wasn't the right approach. Yeah. Um, Things in hindsight that you can see really clearly... Uh, you know, maybe maybe you started a new small group from your old one. It was just too quick. Like you jumped the gun. And it wasn't because you did it out of pride, but you just did it out of inexperience. And you look back, it did damage, you know. It it caused some hurt along the way, but it wasn't ultimately something that was out of a, a hard heart. It was just out of immaturity. Yeah. And that still hurts. No, oh, no kidding. Scott Hubbard is my guest. He is over at DesiringGod.org. We're talking about Uh, leaders that fail well and how mistakes can become like a staircase. We'll take a short break and be right back with Scott. Hi, I'm Bill Arnold. If you have questions about Jesus or want to chat with someone about it, text FAITH. To 41224. That's text faith to 41224. And God bless you. So glad to be with Scott Hubbard today. We're talking about failures and. God will use your failures, so just relax. He's at work in your life. And if you're experiencing failures now and then, it's because you're taking risks, hopefully calculated ones, and God will reveal and teach you through your failures. 
Scott says, every failure is like a stair. That was a beautiful illustration, Scott. Now, if you missed any of this, you're going to want to hear it from the beginning because Scott is very um, intentional with everything he says, which is one of the reasons I love having him on the show. So let's talk about, uh, we talked about owning your failure, and Peter did a great job of that. Uh, He went out and wept bitterly, and then he owned his failure uh, in front of the Lord. And now let's move on to what we can learn, how we learn. Yeah, so owning failure, if that's the first step, that's kind of getting into the posture of being teachable from our failures, as opposed to getting your back up and, uh, you know, receiving it with a prideful heart or receiving it with a heart that's just so full of so full of shame and embarrassment that you, you've run away entirely. Peter struck right in the middle where he felt it deeply and he didn't run away. So that's owning, and that is really just putting you in the posture of a learner. And I think that part of benefiting from failure comes not only from recognizing, you know, raising your hand, as it were, as the one who is responsible, but from at that point, turning and taking a look at the failure right in the face and asking what it has to teach us for next time, which is so painful. It's so because painful. Because it requires having this kind of long-term vision in mind. Yeah. If you just have today in mind, just have this week in mind, it can feel so tempting just to shove that thought aside. In yeah. the aftermath of a failure, just to soothe yourself, to distract yourself, to do anything but from mulling over what yeah. just happened. Or if you do mull it over, sometimes it can just be, a temptation to feel this fresh sense of mere shame or condemnation. Mm -hmm. But here's the passage that gives me hope for what we can learn. This is what Jesus tells Peter. Actually, before Peter denies Jesus, Jesus says to Peter, when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. So right there, even before the denials happen, Jesus is able to see the man that Peter is going to become through his failure, (laughs) you know, as he's now chastened about the kind of man that he is, as he realizes more of his own sinfulness and realizes more of Christ's sufficiency for him, Jesus is able to look and see, you're going to be an apostle. And so I need you to have this long range vision in mind. I no doubt Peter remembered those words as words of hope in the aftermath of his failure that Jesus had not today and its shame in mind, ultimately, but tomorrow and its maturity in mind. I love that when we play with the, the, the long, the big picture in mind, it's a completely different experience, regardless of how painful it is the day you're examining your failure. Yeah, that's right. I mean, if you can be mature enough to say, but in the long run... Yeah. Which is not easy to do, Scott Hubbard. No, it's I not. Because, yeah. <laughs> on yeah. the one hand, you have to you know, shove away those thoughts that you just want to distract yourself. And then as you go and walk patiently back through the failure, you have to avoid at every point just this mere shame or mm-hmm. mere condemnation that comes yeah. along. So it has to be this walking with Jesus in the midst of failure. The, uh, you know, Our forgiving Lord, the same Lord who walked with Peter on the Galilean shore and said and restored him. Do you love me, Peter? Mm-hmm. And offering him the threefold affirmation of his love for his Lord. What if you have one of those continuous loops in your brain and you start replaying the failures and all that does is lead you to a place of shame or, or you feel like condemnation? Yeah. Talk about that. That's good uh, because that's no doubt a common experience. I think, on, and this is probably where community comes in so helpfully, Walking through failure well, I don't talk about this in the article, but walking through failure well requires other people. Uh, Peter had Jesus in the flesh to do this with him, Mm -hmm. to walk with him through his failure, to restore him. We often need the spirit of Jesus plus the people of Jesus to help us walk through failure well. And I think if we're doing that in community with people we love and trust, they're going to be able to help us spot what are the things we can learn from this and then where are we just spiraling? And need to be told, no, it's not time to go back there again. It's time to set that aside. You've learned from it. You know what you've learned from it. And now let's move on, which is obviously easier said than done. And so if when, when the spiral happens, when you realize, oh, I'm just continuing to go back here, this is a loop. Mm-hmm. That's a fight of faith now where it requires you know, some defiance and some steadfast hope in the promises of God for us, that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And right now, I've done the work of learning from this. Now mm-hmm. I, I need to move on. Yeah. 
I'm just thinking if if you've made a mistake, you, you kind of want to keep it to yourself as best you can. You're not going to say, hey, friends, gather around. Let, <laughs> let, let me tell you about my big mistake. <laughs> I mean, so that community part would be uh, a struggle. But there you have yeah. vulnerability and accountability. You do. Yeah. And here's the deal. We're the community of the cross. I where, know. Uh, where uh, I know. We get in by saying, hey, I'm a big failure. Hey, I'm a big sinner. That's, yeah. that's the entrance. That's the entrance, and that is still the terms of membership. I know. <laughs> I try to say something smart, and he just says something smarter. That's always the way it works with Scott Hubbard. Oh, so it can be this, this fresh invitation into the gospel, right? Oh, no, like, exactly. Yeah, this yeah. is who I am. This is who Jesus is. Yeah. I wonder how good we are at owning our mistakes and, and saying, what can I learn from these? <laughs> <laughs> well, I wrote this article because I'm not very good at it. Okay. And it's something that I really need to grow in. I, I'm, you know, among a kind of leader where one of the things I struggle with most is kind of insecurity and this feeling of, uh, you know, feeling like a, uh, a failure often Okay, and getting caught up in things that have, you know, second, second guessing regrets, that kind of stuff. So yeah. I need this a lot. So maybe you can give us some imagery. Let's say I've made a mistake and I'm suffering and I'm, I'm just, I'm down. Can you, ha- can you give it me, give us any imagery? Well, I talk about this, you know, staircase that the Lord is making often in our failures. And I'll just read a, a line that I wrote in here that is something that I need to hold on to. So what, what, what might happen if we asked for help from Jesus to walk alongside us to help us review our failures with an eye toward tomorrow. Here's what, here's what we might find. We might find that errors become humility, that mistakes become maturings, that regrets become wisdom, that self-inadequacy becomes Christ-sufficiency, and that failures become reliable stairs. So that staircase image is one that I find myself repeating to myself now. And when I'm feeling the sting of making a mistake, Mm -hmm. every failure is a stair. He's building a staircase made of failure. If I'll own this and learn from it and then keep leading. Yeah. Boy, that's significant. There's also a great image in this article at desiringgod.org of if you're if you're down, imagine Jesus lifting you up from the ground, looking you in the eye, and offering both a question and a call. Yeah, boy, there's truth and grace right there, isn't there? Yeah, that's right. So this now gets to the final step of keep leading, and it's that John twenty one scene with Jesus and Peter. That's what he does to Peter. He offers him a question and a call. Mm-hmm. The question was, "Do you love me? <laughs> Do you love me, Peter?" And one of the things that that reminds us, that tells us, is that through failure, not only does God mature us as leaders, but there's actually the possibility of coming to a deeper experience of the love of Christ for us and a deeper experience of love for Christ in us. Because before the failure, I have no doubt that Peter really loved Jesus, but it was shallower than he thought it was. It couldn't withstand the test of Good Friday. Mm -hmm. But then... On the shore where he met Jesus, his love was still real, but now it was way deeper. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And that happened only through the failure, only through knowing more of who Jesus is in failure. Mm -hmm. And then that question also is a a kind of steadying and a kind of reorienting. It reminds us that uh, leadership is ultimately about us. It's not about our reputation, but it's about Jesus. And therefore, if we love him, then we can risk being made to look foolish again. Mm -hmm. We can risk mistakes. Yeah. Scott, we just have about a minute left and there's people listening right now that have just been reminded of a mistake or they're in the middle of one right now and they're suffering and they're thinking, how do I get some relief from this uh, pain? Maybe we could just close this by praying. Would you mind? I'd be glad to. Yeah. Father, thank you that you are the great restorer of souls and that Jesus showed himself as the savior who restores us. And after he told Peter, asked Peter, do you love me? That he said, follow me. And so I pray for those who are feeling the sting of a mistake, that they would do all the necessary things of looking backward, receiving forgiveness from you where they need to. And then when that work is done, you would protect from the evil one and their eyes would be set forward on what it would look like to follow Jesus this afternoon, this evening, tomorrow, this week. And they would have a great hopefulness about the future. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Amen. Thank you, Scott Hubbard. Always a delight to have you here in studio. You can learn more about Scott at DesiringGod.org. The article that we discussed today was called Good Leaders Fail Well, How Mistakes Become a Staircase. We'll take a little break and we'll be right back with more. Thanks for listening. Programming like this is made available through your support. Information available at MyFaithRadio.com.